I remember years ago, people were talking about having a quiet time before God. I really don't know what it is about. I believe that our soul must come to a place of quietness. Amen. Our soul must come to a place of rest. Because if we are tensed, if we are confused, it's very difficult for us to listen carefully and to pay attention. So it's not a question of being silent. Now, here in Europe, I believe we have to improve a lot on that issue here. We have to break silence. Yes. Yes. Yeah, are you with me? Yes. In my life, I had to break that. I had been silent for too many years. There is a difference between silence and quietness. Yes. Silence is passive. Silence is empty. Nothing happens. Quietness is because the place is full of his presence. And when the place is full of his presence, our soul has to be quiet. Are you with me? But we are not silent, so I don't, we, are, we don't want to have these quiet times anymore. Amen? We want our spirit to be full of passion, full of energy, full of um, fire, full of not excitement, because excitement comes, excitement goes. But passion, divine passion, must be in our hearts. Amen? So this morning, every morning, let's have a strong time of short and intensive praise worship without music we don't need music to worship him because the spirit of worship is inside our hearts so we just have to launch that and we are in his presence we are connected with heaven can you say amen to that now yesterday night i was in second peter chapter one chapter yeah chapter whatever chapter one when i spoke and i showed you some things which i believe are very important it was also important in the first night when we are together to come to the same page, to be on the same page together. Because we, came, we come from different places, we come from different situations. Maybe some of us, we carry situations with us into the school of reformation, into this time of training. And we have to be careful with that because as we are here together, it's about him. He must set the agenda. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Now, we can have problems, we can have issues, we can have unanswered prayers, we can have things in our lives, in our families, in our finances, in our inner man, which are heavy, which, are, which we are concerned about, but we have to be very careful how we cope with that. Amen? So the, the issues of lives don't set the agenda. Are you with me? God has to set the agenda. Amen. And as we follow him, he will help us to fix the problems. He will help us with the issues of our lives. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? So this is very important for us. Elsewhere, the devil can always create some issues. So we, somehow our soul life, our inner man, will always be booked with something. Always be focusing, focusing on something because there will always be something happening somewhere. If not in our lives, then in somebody else's life. And then their worries become our worries. Their concerns become our concerns. And then we accumulate and we gather a lot of weight with us. And all this, all this weight can set the agenda of our lives, which, just, which is not okay. God has to set the agenda. Amen. Jesus was very clear. I'm amazed about how clear he was from the very first beginning. Sometimes we are starting somewhere and then we are developing certain things. We are warming up on the way to something. Jesus never operated like that. Jesus started where he was. Amen. So in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, already from the very beginning, he had just called them in. They didn't know what they were doing, where they were going. They just knew they were called. Amen. And because they were called, they began to follow him. But Jesus was very clear from the very beginning. In churches, we have something called sometimes called new beginners class. Jesus had no new beginners class. This is, this is coming from the secular world. This is coming from the school, from education. We have first grade, we have second grade, we have third grade. So in church, we have a new beginners class. Then later, we have a, a class for the continuers for advanced people and then one day we have leadership training and then we have pastoral training then we have pastors conferences 
I refuse to have pastors' conferences. I don't, I don't want any. And I know if we just have conferences, pastors will never show up because they are too advanced for normal conferences. You know what I'm saying? That's why they never show up. They just come and then they leave. I was in Russia in last December, and, uh, and the pastor was there, and I had to teach in, the, in his Bible school for five days, Monday to Friday, and then in the church in the following weekend. And he welcomed me five minutes from the microphone. Then I took over. Then he sat in the back five minutes. Then he left, and I didn't see him again. Now, that's, what, that's how pastors are. And that's a wrong understanding. And I'm not blaming them because I've been in the same place. But I repented from that sin and God delivered me. And because basically we all need to hear the word of God. Amen. Amen. And when God speaks, it will be relevant for everybody. Amen. It will be relevant for all levels if we talk about levels. If you are advanced, if you hear the word of God, you will learn something, you will see something, you will hear something. Are you with me? If you are a new beginner, being saved for one week, you will hear something, you will see something, you will understand something. So we don't do pastor's conferences anymore. Now, we just did it three weeks ago in Switzerland because we, we must know where we are. Amen? And we must start where we are. God is not unfair. He knows where we are. And in, in the process of working with him, he will come and take us from where we are. And then he will take us into what he wants. Amen? So we have to take things where they are. If they are not on a high level, then we have to go low and take them higher. Are you with me? But in the future, in the years to come, we, we will not do pastor's conferences anymore. GLS is for everybody. I love that thought. Everybody is welcome. Because when God is in the house, everybody can meet him. It's not about who you are, your position, your title. If you're a pastor, assistant pastor, or, or cleaning chief assistant, second assistant for the cleaning ministry. If God is in the house, what he says will become relevant for everybody. Everybody will eat something and drink something which will become relevant for them in their lives, in their situation. Amen? That's why Jesus was very clear from the very beginning. That's why we should not have beginner's class or advanced class. Which we should just have training programs. And people who, are, who hear God's call to join, they must join. And they will learn something, they will see something, they will hear something. Amen? So yesterday night... I really work to bring us to the same page and to tune all the instruments in this wonderful symphony orchestra which is gathered together here. And uh, I spoke about this word of, Paul, of, of Peter where he, where he is underlining. Let me remind you of the few main thoughts. He reminded them of the size of God's plan. That he was a huge plan. It was a Something which goes beyond human thinking and imagination. Amen. He, he talked about how, how he started, how Peter followed it from the beginning, how he was on the mountain of transfiguration. God was there, heaven open. Amen. So he underlines for them the size, the scope of God's plan and agenda. And we must understand that. It goes beyond having church. Are you with me? The church is the agent of the kingdom on earth. But the church is not the final point. The final point is the kingdom has to advance in the nation. That's the final point. Amen. Heaven has to spread on earth until the whole earth is full of his glory. The church has a role to play in that. The house of God has a role to play in that. But it's, it's the agent of the, of the kingdom. But the plan of God goes beyond church. Are you with me? So God has to help us to look beyond the local church. We need the local church. We need a local expression of the kingdom in the city, in the, in the urban frame. But God's plan goes beyond that. Are you with me? So even the church can have bad season, we must still focus on God's plan. Are you with me? Even if our lives, if we have a bad season in our life, we have to keep focusing 
on God's global plan. Because as we do that, from that vision, from that, as we look into that and we look long enough into that, we will get all the keys we need to solve our situation. Amen. Amen. That's what Peter said. I don't know how it is in Beth Bithynia or in Pontus or Cappadocia, but I know one thing. The plan of God is huge. Amen. Yeah. It's not a titanic project. It's a huge plan which is going to success. Amen. Yeah. The second thing he underlines is the sovereign backing up of heaven. He said, all heaven is ready for this. We have explained to you the power of this plan. So Peter underlines that all heaven will back up God's plan. Are you with me? This is important for us. The third thing he underlines is this. is the nature of the forces in operation. I'll just remind you what I spoke about yesterday. The fourth thing is... The increasing involvement of the Son. He speaks about the coming, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, it means, it does not speak only about His second coming. It's speaking about as the, the plan of God advances, Jesus will come on the scene more and more. He will come into the picture more and more. Are you with me? He will come into the meetings more and more. He will come into our lives more and more. He will, he will push through our limitations. He will push himself into our lives. Are you with me? His presence will come. His presence will come when we want it and when we don't want it. Amen? Sometimes it will just come upon us and we have to know how to handle it. We cannot say, God, I'm, I'm not ready for this. Just be ready. Amen? Don't say, God, I have a bad situation. This is not a very good month for you to show up in my life. Wait until April. God will not wait until April because God does not know anything about April. There is not Mar no March, no April in heaven. God shows up when he shows up. And he knows better. Amen. So sometimes we think like this. God, I have a bad situation. I don't feel well in this period of time. This spring is not good for me. God, please come later. God comes when he comes. Are you with me? So Peter says, we, we have talked about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means the Son of God will appear more and more on the scene. And he will appear more and more powerfully on the scene. Are you with me? As we praise him, as we worship him, we build a platform for him and he will come. Are you with me? And when he comes, he does not want to be on the second row. He wants to take over. Are you with me? So this is what Peter says. We have talked to you about this. And now I want to remind you of this. The increasing involvement of the son. Basically, he's the head of the church. Amen. And the head is in charge. The, f the fifth thing I told you yesterday night was this, the eternal validity of the word. When God has spoken something, it is there. It is just there. Are you with me? Nobody can alter it. Nobody can affect it. It is there. When it is spoken, it is there for all eternity. It does not, it is not fulfilled immediately. It can take time, it can take months, it can take years. But when God has spoken a word, the word is there. Amen. What the word will, will wait for is people to connect with the word. Are you with me? But when God finds people who will connect with the word, will take the word into their lives, will align with the word, will let the word reform their lives, that word will begin to explode on earth. Are you with me? Are you listening to this? When I came to Romania the first time back in 19, whatever, 14, maybe, 73, I think, I had one word. God said to me, God spoke to me about the, the widow of Nain. And God showed me that when Jesus spoke to the young, the dead young man, his words brought him back to life. And God said to me, when you go to Romania, you speak the words I give you because I will give you words of life. And when you speak them, people will come alive. Are you with me? 
One word, just one word from the very beginning, the same word. And every time I came here, and I've been here, I don't know, 70 times or 75 times, every time I came, God reminded me, remember the assignment. The assignment is not to have this and that and meetings and Bible school and churches. The assignment for you is speak words of life. Because when you speak them in all simplicity, in all humility, that word will work for itself. You don't have to emphasize it. You don't have to push it. You don't have to pull it. There is power enough in the word to move people. Amen? So don't force people. Don't manipulate people. Don't pull people. Don't push them. Don't push something down their throat. Just speak it. As accurate as you can. As simple as you can. Because as you do that, some people will catch it. Some people will reject it. Some people did. But some people will catch it. And that word of life will bring them to life. Amen. And it has happened. Amen. Some of you here are the testimony of that. The confirm confirmation of this word. So the word has eternal validity. That's what Peter said. We, I heard these words from the very beginning. And these words, we have kept them in good seasons, in bad seasons. Peter had bad seasons. Are you with me? He was not only walking on water and watching Moses and Elijah. Sometimes he was watching the devil. And the devil was watching him. Are you with me? He denied Jesus three times. In a very significant moment of the life of Jesus, a very important time, in the, process, in the advancing process of the kingdom on earth, Peter just failed miserably. But God, but he had a word. Amen. So remember the eternal validity of the word. The next one I spoke about yesterday night is the requirements from God's partners on earth. We have to heed. We have to lay hold of certain things. Amen. Are you here this morning? Yes. This is a requirement. So it's not, it, will, it will not be an easy road. Can I get an amen in the house? It is not an easy road. God has never told us it will be easy. He said to us, I will be with you. That's what we have. That's the part of the assignment. But he never said the road will be easy. Actually, he said the road will be difficult. But verses like that, we just jump over them. In our blessing mentality, in our whatever triumphing, triumphant mentality, we just jump over certain verses. Jesus said, the gate is narrow. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, let's go there quickly. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. Are you there? Did you find Matthew? I hope so. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now, as we read these verses, our evangelical minds label these verses in a certain way. So when we read these verses, our first thought is this. This is about salvation. Are you with me? Because Jesus uses the word destruction. So we think destruction, whoo, that's hell. So wide, narrow is the gate to salvation and broad is the gate now is the gate to heaven, but broad is the gate to hell. Now, Jesus is not talking about salvation here because he's talking to his coming apostles. He has already called them. They are following him, and he is talking to them in, this, in, this, in these verses. So Jesus is not talking about eternal destruction. I believe he is talking about the destruction of the assignment. Destruction of our destiny. So we can find the broad way. I mean, 
salvation is not difficult. Are you with me? Salvation is very easy. Basically, we have to do nothing because he did everything. Are you with me? And because he did everything, the road to salvation is not a narrow road. It's a broad road. Anybody can be saved anytime. Whoever calls on his name will be saved. It is not difficult. It's not complicated. Even, even simple people will find the way. The Bible says. Are you with me? So salvation is not difficult. Jesus did everything which was necessary for us to receive eternal life. We had to do nothing else than to believe it and receive it. So the narrow way is the kingdom way. Salvation is easy, but walking in the kingdom is not easy. Are you with me? So the narrow gate is not the gate into salvation, and the wide gate is the gate down to hell. I believe, this is my understanding, I believe that the gate, the wide, the wide way is the way to salvation. But after that, to walk in the kingdom is demanding. Are you with me? He made it easy for us. He paid the price for us, for us to be saved. We had to do nothing. He did everything. He paid the price. When we are saved, as we walk on the kingdom road, we have to pay the price. For salvation, he paid the price. To walk on the kingdom road, you have to pay the price. That's the difference. And that's where the difficulty begins. That's where the narrowness begins. Because we have to pay a price. We have to invest in it. We have to die to ourselves. Are you with me? Yeah. We have to, the flesh has to die. This is difficult. This is narrow. This is pushing us from time to time. But that's why Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. And, and that narrow gate will lead you not to the destruction of your destiny. You will fulfill destiny. Amen. To get to heaven is not difficult. To fulfill destiny is difficult. Amen? Just to preach and have good meetings is easy. To have people saved is easy because Jesus made everything possible. To heal people is not that difficult because he provided healing. We have to grow in it. God has to do more among us. I know that because we still have sick people among us. Some of us are sick. But we will see his healing power fill the house. But this is not difficult. The difficult road is the kingdom road, to walk in destiny. Because the devil, I mean, the devil can live with the fact that we are going to heaven. But the devil has problems with us changing the earth. That's his problem. If he can keep us away from heaven, he will be happy. But if we are going to heaven, he, will, he can do nothing about it. But then he will try to hinder us in changing earth before we go to heaven. Are you, are, you, are you listening to me? He knows he cannot affect heaven, but he tries to keep the control of the nations. But we want the nations to come under God's control. That's why we want to walk in destiny. That's why we want to pay the price. That's why we have no problem with the narrowness of the road. We have no problem with the... Oh, yeah with the narrowness of the gate and of the road, because it will lead us to the success of destiny. But just to live like a Christian on our way to heaven is a wide road. It's not difficult, because he did everything which was, which was necessary. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Okay? So Jesus, there are some requirements, but Christians are messed up here, because there is such a disorder in our thoughts. There is such a disorder in our thinking because we think everything is grace and we have, a, we have such a wrong understanding of grace. So we think that we don't need to do anything because we are accepted, we are loved, we are forgiven, we don't have to do anything. There is no price to pay because he paid the price. So we are on our way to heaven. We bought a ticket in the gospel train taking us to heaven. And we sing worship songs on the way to heaven. This is, not, this is not God's reality. This is false Christianity. Are you with me? But this is the point of confusion. 
When it comes to God's love and acceptance and forgiveness, are you with me? Without any condition, it's difficult for us to receive it. But when God speaks about requirement, we say we, d we don't have to fulfill any requirement. So what is free, we want to pay. What we have to pay, we make it for free. So we are totally confused. Most Christians are still fighting with condemnation. Which is an amazing thing because there is no condemnation for whoever is in Christ. It is, it's a gift. It's for free. Are you with me? He set us free from all condemnation. We are totally accepted as we are. When we came to him, we came as we were. Amen? We came with all the mess, with all the disorder, or maybe with all the order. We came in different ways, but we came to him as we were. Everything we received was for free. Amen? But the question is, why are so many Christians still fighting with guilt? with inferiority, with shame, with condemnation, with rejection, because he gave it to us for free. Are you with me? So we are, we are, we, it's difficult for us to receive that. But when God speaks about requirements, because there are requirements, not to receive, but to walk in the kingdom, then we back off and say there is no requirement, everything is for free. So there is so, so much disorder in our thoughts. When it comes to his love, his care, his acceptance, it is for free. Are you with me? Are we clear about this? It's for free. He gave it to us. We took it. We receive it. We trust it. We believe in it. And we will not let it go. Are you with me? We will never let shame come upon us anymore. We will never let guilt feelings attack us anymore. We will not let fear penetrate our lives anymore because when we love him, fear has to go. Are you with me? All this is for free. We don't have to do anything to get it. But when it comes to the kingdom road, there are certain things we have to do. Here there is no requirement. We just trust him and receive it. Here there is a requirement. That's the place where so many Christians are confused. And they mess it up. They switch the two things. Then there is certain requirements to please him. We have to worship him. We have to pray one hour a day. We have to read the Bible. We have the Bible reading plan. We have all these laws and, and regulations. No, sir, is free. We have some people in our church. They were so much into legalism. We even had to ask them to stop reading the Bible. We didn't even dare to say it. We didn't, we didn't want anybody to quote us anywhere. But we told them, stop, because every time they read the Bible, it produced rejection. It produced condemnation. They could not keep the standard. Every time they opened the Bible, the Bible accused them. I mean, the Bible did not accuse them. They accused themselves. Because the Bible, the Word of God is full of freedom, full of life, full of acceptance. Amen? There is no fear, no condemnation. But somehow we had to tell them, take a break. Just listen to the preaching until the preaching sets you free from all fear, condemnation, shame, guilt feelings, inferiority. Then read the Bible because the Bible will just accelerate the process. Can we say amen to that? So there are requirements. But in some churches you cannot talk about requirements because immediately they will feel like they are under the law. You are not under the law. You are walking in the kingdom. Yes. And in the kingdom, there are requirements. For salvation, there is no requirement. Just trust him, believe in him, receive in faith. Amen? Walk in it is provided for. But when it comes to living in the, in the kingdom, when it comes to destiny, there are requirements. We have to fulfill certain conditions. And if we don't fulfill them, Destiny will be destroyed. We will not reach the finishing line. We will not fulfill the assignment. Are you listening to me? Yeah. That's why we have to have order in our minds. God has to separate things. So when it comes to love, we are safe. We are secure. We are loved. We are accepted. Amen? 
If we sin, we know what to do with sin. Amen? Do you know what to do with sin? I hope you know what to do with sin. Okay? Sin is not a problem. Sin can be fixed very quickly because God provided the way. Amen? And he broke the power of sin. Not only broke sin, but he broke the power of sin upon our lives. So there are requirements for the kingdom road, for fulfilling destiny. And Peter says, heed, lay hold on the word. Like I did, since the way, since the day I answered the call and followed him, was on the mountain, was in the valley, denied him. I went through all that, but the word is still burning inside of me. It's burning in my bones. It's burning in my mind. And he rose to them, guys, heed the word. Yeah. Amen? That's a requirement. There is something we have to do. Yeah. Amen? The, the last thing I told you about yesterday night was the danger of private interpretation. This is such a danger. When we become familiar with the things of God, little by little, we have private interpretations. This is what I mean about this. This is my angle, and this is your angle. Let's share our angles. We have to be careful with private interpretation. We need constantly the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Because to enter, there are certain words. Now listen. Sometimes we have the impression as Christians that we can just read the Bible and everything is there. Now everything is there, but most of it is locked. Because God wants to make sure that in order for us to understand the Bible, that we go to Him first and get the key. Are, are you listening to me? So revelation is not like spread on the floor and we can just pick it up as we want. Certain things are available immediately, but there are certain things God has reserved for certain situations and certain levels of maturity. Amen? Now, some Christians don't like that because we are all in the same boat. I'm sorry. We are not all in the same boat. There are different levels in the kingdom. Amen? There are different levels of maturity. There are different levels of stature. There are certain words, if God, if God released them, if God, if God will leave them uh, or re reveal the meaning of this word, it will just blow us out of the picture. Totally blow us, or we will misuse them or abuse them or twist their meaning so God keeps them locked until proper time. Are you with me? But we have this impression that we can walk through the Bible and pick up what we want and let it, and let it be what we want. We cannot do that. We have to walk with him. And he will unlock the Bible. Amen. Everything we need is there. But go to him. Walk with him. And as you walk with him, things will emerge. Things will come up. Things will come alive. Amen. It will protect us from the danger of private interpretation. And Peter is warning us that in the last days, there will be a lot of false prophets and false teachers. Now, he does not say that to scare us so we become suspicious every time we meet somebody. Is he false or is he genuine? No, just relax. Walk with God. Are you with me? But the fact is that there will be many interpretations. There is a danger into that. That's why we have to connect well to a house. Amen. We have to be connected well to spiritual fathers so we feel safe in these days. Amen. So this was important for me to bring Yesterday night, so we are in the same page. We're looking in the same direction. We have all our eyes fixed on heaven. Amen. 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 Okay. Where do we go from here? Let's see. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. Now I want to show you certain things which I believe are important. As I told you previously this morning, Jesus was very clear from the very beginning. I, I remember I had a season in my life where I thought, you know, the Gospels, okay, Jesus was walking around making miracles and great. And I had the feeling that the Gospels were not very important anymore. It was just for the beginner's class. I have realized the last two years that the four Gospels are so important because Jesus is the pattern of a son. Amen. He, he, he formed the model. He formed 
the prototype of how a person on earth can walk on earth, change the earth while connected to heaven. He formed the prototype. So we have to read the Gospels, the four Gospels, with a totally, with a new freshness. Are you with me? With an open heart so God can reveal to us how Jesus, not just how he did the miracles, but how he, as the Son of God, walked on earth, having a Father in heaven, being the Son of God on earth, connected to heaven through the Holy Spirit, how he operated on earth, connected to heaven, in order to bring heaven to earth. Now, if God can open that for us, we will be able to live on earth as the sons and daughters of the living God. And this is what the whole world is waiting for. The revelation of the sons of God. Not the baby sons, but the adult sons. We have this picture, also a Christian picture in our minds, where we are the children of God, and we have this children picture that we are small children. Get rid of that. I say get rid of that. And it still comes, you know, in, in the church, some people talk about it. It even comes in words of knowledge, in words of prophecy, that God is our Father and He hugs us and He kisses us and He pulls His finger through our hair and He, we sit on His lap. All this, we have to get rid of it. There was a season when He was like that for us. We needed it. We were so beaten up by the devil, so we, need, he, we needed that treatment. But let me tell you one thing. This is not a lifestyle for the rest of your life. God wants to raise us up. Amen. God wants us to leave his lap. Come on. We don't need to be hugged every morning or 10 times a day. We have to grow up because God wants to share his business with us. He wants to include us in, in the fulfillment of his will on earth. That's a huge, this is not a titanic project. This is a huge project, amen? So God wants to raise us children. Yeah, we started like babies, but we want to grow up, amen? We have been sitting on his lap. Yes, some of us who have been sitting there all too long. It's time to get alive. And God, there are certain words God cannot talk with us because we are still in that baby mood, baby mode. God wants to talk to us as to elder sons and daughters, responsible, accountable, are you with me? Mature, carrying some stature, fulfilling requirements, serious with what we are doing, excellent with what we are doing, consistent with what we are doing. There are certain values, certain ingredients in our lives which He has produced through His Word, through His Spirit, and these ingredients are there. We are not babies anymore. We don't, we don't need to be, you know, sometimes people come to me after meeting and say, oh, Philip, this was so good because it confirmed what I had on my heart. Hey, we have to pass that point Amen. where we have to have things confirmed. You must be convinced. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Oh, this was a good confirmation. Why do we need all this confirmation all the time? It's because we are insecure in our identity. We must grow up. Yes. Amen? Yes. Let's get rid of all this, the whole encouragement package. Oh, thank you for your encouragement. I did not encourage you. Actually, I shook you for hours. Thank you for great encouragement. It was, I'm not here to encourage you. I'm here to upgrade you. Amen? And sometimes encouragement makes us fall asleep. Sometimes we, we become dependent on encouragement, so we are seeking encouragement all the time. We are looking... Oh, next Sunday, God, I really need encouragement. Thank you, Pastor, for the... What is that? It's the symptom of internal insecurity. So we need that encouragement all the time. We need appreciation all the time. Why do we need that? It's because we are not mature. People who need to be appreciated, you know, all the time. Oh, that was great. Mm, well done. Mm, great. You, way high five. I don't need a high five after the meeting. You know, great. Oh, good job, Philip. Good job. Really good job. Yeah, thank you. I don't need that. If I needed that, my goodness, I'm not in a place to teach you in these days. 
because I have to do what I have to do, even if you appreciate, appreciate it or not. Even either you encourage me or not, I have to do it. We have become so dependent. This is a charismatic animal living in the house. The church is not a zoo for animals. The church is the house of God. We have to grow up. There are requirements. The kingdom road is for mature people. Amen? So check your hearts. I was in that place, you know. I was looking, I was, I was reading the faces. I remember I had the church once. God had to really, really, really shake, shake me. Because I was reading the faces all the time. Oh, they don't like what I'm saying. They like what I'm saying. What should I do? Uh, now they like what I'm saying. They don't like what I'm saying. I mean, I'm here to please him. I'm here to walk with him. I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm here to do the best I can. Amen? I'm here. I, I want to grow up to maturity. Do you understand? Because some, some people will not like. I remember once he and Cruz, the guy came to me. He was in the meeting. The pastor, and he came to me and said, Philip, I want to eat Romanian breakfast with you tomorrow morning. I said, what is that? Oh, you, you will see. So we had Romanian breakfast. Then we ate breakfast with a good time. Then he said, I don't like the way you work. <laughs> okay. Then I said to him, I don't like the way you work either. <laughs> then he laughed. I laughed. Then we had a good time. You know, the, the, the matter was settled. I mean, I like people like that. I prefer people like that. They say what they mean. And they mean what they say. Then we talked and I explained to him what I was doing, why I did it the way that I did it. And so on. some people will not like it, but we have to do the work. Are you with me? This is the kingdom road. There will be narrow passages. There will be places where there is no encouragement, but we still have to walk. There will be some places where we are not appreciated, where we don't receive what we want. But if you receive what you need, then be happy. Go with that. Amen. Are you, are you listening to me? So we have to learn how to walk in such a way. God needs a certain company of people for the new day. Not everybody will qualify. Not every Christian will qualify. Oh, but Philip, you are introducing two classes of Christians. I am not. There is only one class, one category of believers. It's kingdom believers. Whoever is not, I don't know where they are. God must judge who they are. They will go to heaven if he wants them to go to heaven. It's not my problem. God needs a certain category of people to partner with him on the day of his power. Yeah. There are certain requirements for believers, for leaders, for pastors. Not every pastor will be there on that day. Not every pastor, not every church will qualify for that day either. That's why we have to learn how he walked. Are you me? We have to look into the scripture. God has to help us understand. God has to open the word for us. So we see how a son of God live on earth and partner with the father in heaven. Not on the way to heaven, but changing the earth before he went to heaven. It took three years for Jesus to fulfill his mission. We have been working hard for 2,000 years. Maybe there is something we must learn. Are you with me? Could be there was something. That's why it irritates me when, pastors, when people say, oh, I know, I know. No, we don't know. We know so little, basically. And we are shocked again and again how little we know. Or maybe we know, we know a lot, but we have little understanding of what we know. We think we know it, but suddenly God comes, reveals what he means, and then we know that we didn't know. <laughs> then we begin to understand. Are you with me? So I will take you to the beginning of the book of the Gospel of Matthew.